Hello YouTube, I'm Vince White. I'm an employment attorney and on this channel we answer publicly posted questions from YouTube users getting folks the answers they need from an employment attorney. We've got a question here from YouTube user David. Not going to read your last name. Not, I believe, the same person as friend of the channel David. I believe these might be two different humans. And David asks us, is it worthy to have dual attorneys on a case? Well, David, it depends on how you mean. So right off the bat, I'll say this. Uh, our firm handles every single case as a team of three. Occasionally, we have more than three attorneys, and it's something we do where we add additional resources to cases as they're required. Now, those resources could take the place of additional general attorney hours. They could take the, the form of um, teams to come in, uh, you know, of, of licensed attorneys who are going to come in and, and help review additional discovery dumps. Like if you get 500,000 pages of discovery, the team of three assigned to your case, they're going to they're gonna have some difficulties with that, right? So you have to, you have to add resources. <clears throat> and now a lot of firms might choose to use non-attorneys to code, to code depositions and review discovery like that. That, to me, is a mistake because it severely limits the attorney's fee application that your firm can make if this case ends up winning at trial. Now, counterpoint to that is having non-attorneys do the work can be effective, especially if they're well-trained, and it is a fraction of the cost of having attorneys do the work. And statistically speaking, most cases don't go to trial, and most cases then if they don't go to trial, can't win at trial, so you can't make an attorney fee application. So um, I'm choosing, we're choosing as a firm to use attorneys to do that work because one, we do think the result is slightly better, but also um, we expect that enough of our cases will go to trial and win at trial that it's worthwhile to have attorneys do that work and then to maximize that attorney fee application should you win at trial. So when you say, is it worthy to have dual attorneys on your case? Yeah, it is, right? Like, so, uh, you're going to have your, your associate, who's going to be the day-to-day -day contact. Generally, it's going to be a research and writing attorney. You're going to have litigation partners. You're going to have partners who might specialize in um, settlement. You might have people who work on things like managing press narratives controlling the uh, the public perception of the situation on certain cases that are, you know, a little bit more out in the open. Cases where the, uh, the court of public opinion matters more than usual. Uh, you might also, listen, you can add, and I've certainly done it, you, you can add attorneys who specialize in deposition work to cases. You can add um, attorneys who are particularly charming to a trial team, right? There are, listen, sometimes you look at a jury and you say, Oh, I know. I know the attorney that this jury would respond to. And then you put that attorney on that case because you don't leave any of the tools in the toolbox, right? If you think something's going to move the needle for your client, you do it. There's attorneys who specialize in causing grief and agitation in the other side. I don't even know if they mean to, but I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of somebody right now who, who I use routinely um people will call me up and say flat out hey if you stop so and so from calling me i don't want to hear any more of these these effing motions <clears throat> no more motions to compel no more he's looking for sanctions against me just just enough already <clears throat> vince i want to cut you a check and this this idiot all he, all he wants to do is fight, and I just want to cut you a check. I'll tell you right now, that defense counsel did not want to cut a check three months before we put the rage monster on the case, right? But sometimes when <coughs> opposing counsels making motions for you to be sanctioned, and you're a big defense attorney, and you have to pick which case to put money on to settle, well, it can move the needle. 
right? So yes, you certainly want different attorneys with different skill sets, different specializations on a case. David, though, I'm not sure that's what you mean. <coughs> My concern is that you might mean multiple firms on a case, because I think you might have said something to me in a live stream that might have reflected that you wanted firms to keep up on a case. Here's the issue with that. It makes sense and works if you have a really good deal with a firm who's handling your case, but they have some deficiencies, some some gaps in their skill sets, some some open slots in the toolbox. And you want to bring in a firm that has some high level attorneys who can fill in those gaps. That makes sense. Here's the problem. Neither of those firms are going to be especially excited to work for a reduced percentage of your case, right? The cost to create and service an employment law firm is significant, like very significant. So that under firm, that original firm that you hired that might have some gaps in their toolkit, they might agree with you secretly that bringing somebody in to fill in those gaps could result in a better outcome on your case. But what they might not agree is that bringing in that firm to, to fill in those gaps, although it might make your case ultimately more worthwhile, the amount of points on the case, the, the percentage on the case that they're going to have to give up, <coughs> well, even though you're going to do better overall, they might not pocket as much. And they might feel that they're still going to have to do the lion's share of the work on the case and that this specialized people, this specialized firm with the, with the special, whatever you're bringing them in for, might not have to do as much work. And they might be able to just rest on their specialization, their, their, their special skill sets, right? That they're adding to the, to the dynamic here. And they're not going to love that. By the same token, this firm that has the additional skill sets you're looking for, I suspect, because they've spent the time and the money to develop these specialized additional skill sets, well, I suspect they probably already developed all of the baseline ones in our field, right? They're, they're probably pretty savvy and capable of running a case. And then raises the question, well, if they can run a case and get a full percentage on it, or they can collaborate on a case and get a partial percentage on it, is it worthwhile, is it worth the opportunity cost of taking that partial percentage in a case where they're not taking, where they're not handling the whole thing, <clears throat> or does it make sense for them to keep their specialized attorneys with, with specialized skill sets available for their own caseload? And the answer will sometimes be, yeah, it makes sense for them to farm out their specialized attorneys because they only need that skill set once in a while, right? Is controlling a, a public narrative a big job? Yeah. Yeah. But I've never seen it take more than two weeks, right? So, and that's just the nature of how the news and the 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 zeitgeist and, and the meta of of news moves it's it's very rare that you would spend more than two weeks on one sole issue so that that attorney can then work on lots of cases right if that attorney was to maximize their time with their specific skill set well if you assume the most one of those gigs could take is two weeks they could do 26. And odds are most firms are not going to have 26 cases in the press in a given year. Just odds are. Most cases don't get significant press attention. In part because most cases settle, right? But also because there is a limited amount of human attention out there. And generally, news outlets are going to select for cases that get the most attention, so they get the most clicks, or... In the case of some firms like ours, <coughs> sometimes they will select cases where uh, they're going to put additional attention on a case because they want access to other cases that might get lots of clicks, right? So you can, you can get a case that might not be the most uh, attention-grabbing out into the public world, out, out before eyeballs, um, because a reporter might want access to your next client or exclusive or, or whatever it is right 
So just you following with this context, that attorney, well, that attorney might only utilize 10 of her or his 26 available repetitions per year for their firm. And then it might make sense to farm them out. And it, it might be a great deal to work out that you get 15% of a case to, to manage the public narrative because a, f a really great firm in um, Cleveland is doing great work on a case, but they're a little overwhelmed by the public narrative. Like they're getting, they're, they're getting blasted in the press. They don't really know how to go about that. They don't have the context. They, they, they don't really understand uh, sound bites. They don't understand um, the nature of how little is being consumed in in the news media, in the mainstream media, <coughs> and, and how to convey a message in essentially like a a less than TikTok level of attention availability, right? Like those those are skill sets that are different than the standard employment attorney skill set to some extent, and it would potentially be great for that firm in Cleveland to be able to hold on to a client or to maximize the value of a case for a client if they cut a deal with an attorney who could do that. But you heard me throw in there 10, 15%. That's probably what the incoming special skill set attorney is going to ask for. And there's a really good chance that Furman Cleveland is going to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're going to spend max two weeks. So we're talking 80 to 100, 120 hours on this case. We collectively are going to spend hundreds of attorney hours, hundreds of attorney hours. And you want, you want, are you kidding me? You want 15% of this case where we're fronting the expenses, we're doing the bulk of the work. No, never, right? And the specialized attorney is going to say, yeah, that's, that's fine. I mean, you're not hiring me for a couple of hours you're hiring me because i spent a decade building a skill set obtaining reps right um getting opportunities to engage in this process to to develop um a skill set to develop a playbook for an area of the law that very few people get to dabble in Right, the issue is not um, the issue is not that it's impossible to learn how to craft and take control of the public narrative. The issue is that very, very, very few people get the opportunity often enough to learn. And further, those people are largely not interested in mentoring others because I tell you what. It's a hell of a racket. Can you imagine getting 15% of a case for two weeks worth of effort? And in so doing, you get to be on TV and in the papers and on podcasts. Sounds like a hell of a gig. To me, at least, right? So this is this is the interplay here, David. Um, it, it's It can be amazing. And firms do exist <coughs> that make these additional skill sets available. Listen, there's I can think of a firm right now that usually usually when you when you're an employment law firm and you have a forensic IT need, you hire a forensic IT vendor that is not like a law firm. They are just a vendor. And they can be very good. And you can have a long standing relationship with them, they can do great work. But they're not specialized to employment law and when you train up a team at that vendor in what you're looking for in the realm of employment law you're creating a tool for other employment law firms to then purchase and use and i will tell you what that sometimes stinks because you spend a lot of time and effort building up a forensic it vendor and the forensic IT vendor goes out and takes gigs with, I don't know, 15 employment law firms. And you go to the vendor and they say, yeah, yeah, no, we love working with you. You are the OG. We, you, you, you made this area for us. 
we, we do we do have to triple the price though because we're just so popular now interesting you know who wouldn't do that to you an employment law firm that had an in-house forensic IT team because they would want points in the case instead of the hourly and that's a, that's a compelling offering in certain situations it's not my favorite I hate giving away points in a case but there's a lot of firms who don't have the 10 20 grand to throw into forensic IT <clears throat> and they still want to do what's best for their client so they might go to a law firm and they might say hey because you're a law firm and, and, and a, an employment law firm two things are true one i can share a case with you based on points right like we can we can share percentage points it's something you can't do with a vendor who's not an attorney in most jurisdictions two uh you are specialized in this field so you have forensic it um non-attorney people who only do forensic IT in the realm of employment law, in the realm of workplace issues, right? I cannot stress to you how much more that team might find and how much more efficiently that team might work thanks to their wealth of experience in the field, right? Right? Like, there are, there, there is a firm who I'm thinking of right now who doesn't really. I mean, they have some cases of their own, but in many ways, the bulk of their money is coming from being invited into other cases by firms that don't have access or can't afford good forensic IT. And it's a good business model. It's not the one that I would pursue, but they're doing well. I think all the partners... You know, they've got a couple houses. It's it's going well, right? So <clears throat> it can work, David. It absolutely can. And it often does. However, more often than not, that hypothetical firm in Cleveland we talked about, the under firm, the firm that's got a really good base skill set, they do a really nice job. They don't have specializations. They don't have a forensic IT team. They don't have a public narrative person. They don't have, um, I don't know, an ex-judge who can sit and hear mock litigations that um, they, you, you, you can mock up the litigation so the client can see how it's going to go and get, you know, a retired judge's thoughts. Like these, these are all values. These are the, you know, um, But they do a nice job and they know it they know they do a nice job and they've been getting along just fine without those special extras <coughs> and that hypothetical firm in cleveland is probably going to say i don't know that i want to share this and our agreement is one to one and you're trying to make it with with, with somebody else now and, and we don't have to consent um we're gonna if you leave our firm and it's not for some good cause most retainer agreements are going to hold that we keep a lien on your case and in most jurisdictions that lien will in fact be honored at least to some extent so if you say listen cleveland firm you're great you're doing great work you're, you I, I do want some additional skill sets you got to partner up or i'm gonna i'm gonna fire you they might say to you go ahead we we still get our piece <coughs> that is a difficult dynamic a very difficult dynamic to negotiate into because they have very little reason, right? If they believe, yeah, sure, the specialized skill set could make the case ultimately more worthwhile, but the amount of points we're going to have to give up in the case would mean that even though the case is more worthwhile, we will pocket less. Are they going to make that deal? I don't know that they will. I don't know they will. They might. They might. People do. I would say those people tend. <coughs> to be thinking about things like, okay, if I partner with this firm, I will get this skill set for myself eventually. And then eventually I can stop partnering with this firm. Class action work, another great example, right? Like um, there are certain firms who are very, very experienced in handling class action work, which is very specialized. And they have a really great pedigree in that field, the, the field of class action litigation. So what you'll have is you can have like an employment law firm who does cases 
and they get a they get what they believe is a really solid class action, like really valuable. But they don't have enough attorneys <coughs> with a real class action pedigree. They they don't have attorneys with a with a depth of class action experience. Solution is not to punt the case away. The solution is to go to a class action firm, a firm with a tremendous wealth of class action knowledge, who has the call centers. They're, they're fully set up for this kind of work, right? And you go to them and you say, hey, I'd like to partner with you. And um, in so doing, you're going to help me get this case with a finish line. You're going to manage this class for me. <coughs> but also in partnering with you, I am now increasing our firm's class action pedigree. So eventually, should we wish to, we could be the firm who handles class actions because we would have enough of these under our belt that a judge, a federal judge might say, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, counselor. I see you've done this many times. I'm okay. You, you, can, you can take a lead here. Huge. Huge for a firm. Right? But keep in mind, the class action firm is aware that as they help this firm, who's got a good high-value class action, as they help that firm, that firm will eventually stop asking them for help because it will have reached a point where its own pedigree, its own depth of class action experience has sufficiently risen that they no longer need the class action firm. Unless there's like a, a resource issue. Like there's firms <coughs> who have good, really good cases, but maybe they can't afford the case management aspect of class actions like uh, the call centers and things of that nature. The, the non-attorneys and attorneys who are going to be you know, speaking to like hundreds or thousands of claimants. That, that can that can be very expensive. So in that realm, you're probably going to stick with a class action firm if you're a, a smaller, medium-sized employment firm. But generally speaking, that class action firm is going to be aware that they're creating a competitor. And it doesn't take too many repetitions before that competitor is created. So they're going to charge commensurate with the idea that they are creating a competitor in their field, right? It'll be expensive create a tension in that relationship. Anyways, David, I hope I've given you a solid response here. <coughs> Simple answer is yes. Within, within, within a singular firm, you always want to have multiple attorneys. I would never have a every case here, minimum team, three attorneys. Additional attorneys as required. Spread, spread that expertise multiple cases, get additional skill sets assigned to each case, make teams where the sum of all the parts is greater, I think I'm saying that wrong, where, where, where the team as a whole, they're greater than the value of those individuals would be alone, okay? Um, in terms of additional firms, complex. Multiple firms in the case is very complex. It can and is done. Often a challenge. Anyways, David, best of luck to you. Take care.